Our first reading today is from the book of Job. This is our second week in the book of Job, and it's really the, the week where we get what is the, um, want a better word, the guts of Job, which is a series of discussions, a series of three cycles of discussion between Job and his three friends. And um, the friends who originally sit with Job in the ash heap and just share with him in his pain. You'll remember that Job has lost everything, his family, his wealth, uh, his reputation, everything. And his friends initially sit, sit with him there in the ash heap, but then after a while they start telling Job that if he's having all these troubles, he must have done something really bad. And Job just doesn't accept that. So we've got Job here. Job answered, Job 23, verses 1 to 17. Then Job answered, Today also my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I never, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, but he would give heed to me. There an upright person could reason with him. I should be acquitted forever by my judge. If I go forward, though, he's not there. Or backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left, he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come out like gold. My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and have not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured in my bosom the words of his mouth. But he stands alone, and who can dissuade him? What he desires, that he does. For he will complete what he appoints for me, and many such things are in his mind. Therefore I am terrified at his presence when I consider I am in dread of him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. If only I could vanish in the darkness and thick darkness would cover my face. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gosh, there, there are a few passages in the, the Bible as a whole that have such passion, I think, as this um, complaint from Job. And of course, the complaint of Job is a complaint that echoes the cries of people everywhere throughout the world and throughout history. Why do terrible things happen to us? Why do, why do unspeakably terrible things happen to decent human beings? I mean, this is the question. This is the religious question, if you like. Why do good people suffer? Um, Job's friends are keen to, to answer him, of course. And as you go through the cycles of discussion, you read Job, there's 40 something chapters, you know, there's a lot of discussion that goes on. But the theme is basically the same. Um, Job, if you're suffering, you must have done something wrong. And what they're doing here really is trying to defend God, because we know that God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. And, uh, you know, in a sense, that's true to the scriptures, isn't it? We, we've been reading earlier uh, from the book of Proverbs, and you, you you get the feeling from Proverbs, which was written during the time of Solomon when things were going great, that you do the right thing, you'll get rewarded. You want a good and comfortable and solid life? Obey God. Fulfill the commandments. Live with integrity and decency. All good things will happen to you. And the truth is, we know it doesn't always work like that. I mean, yes, sometimes it does. And deep down, all of us want to believe that um, that, that it, it, it should work that way. But the truth is, I think all of us discover at some point or another, it, it's not that simple. Uh, I've spent so much time, I think, with, you know, good, godly people in hospital. You know, I'm thinking particularly of elderly people who are getting close to death and in a lot of pain saying to me, why is this happening to me? I've lived a good life. Um, you know, even solid, wise, spiritual people 
when we're pushed, we, we, we fall back on that, that no, surely we shouldn't be experiencing this level of pain because we've done the right thing. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to good people. And, you know, I, I think in a sense, the book of Job is a critique of the scriptural tradition itself. As I say in Proverbs, you get this rather, could we say, glib perspective that do right and God will reward you. Want a, want a productive and easy life? Follow the commandments. Follow wisdom. And in um, Proverbs, wisdom is depicted as this woman standing on the street corner saying, come to me, come to me, uh, listen to me. You know, she, she's what she's saying is obvious, can be heard by anybody. She's standing right out there in public, uh, sharing the truth. All you've got to do is open your ears. Uh, in Proverbs, you've got the two women, of course. You've got the wisdom standing on one corner and you've got the, the sex worker, the harlot, on the other corner say, no, come to me, um, which reflects it's a yeah, male-dominated uh, environment. But there you've got these the, the two women. But is that obvious? You can choose one or the other. Uh, Job, on the contrary, says, where's wisdom? How do you find wisdom? In other words, how do you make sense of this? Uh, the, 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 my favourite chapter in Job, and, and I'd encourage you to read it if you haven't read it, is chapter 28, which is uh, a little soliloquy he gives. Where is wisdom to be found? Where, where do we find wisdom? There's this beautiful uh, depiction in Job 28. I'm sorry we won't get it next week, uh, where Job depicts people, uh, men, mining the earth. And it's a lovely historical a reflection of the way people in Job's time used to do that. Yes, they used to mine. Um, Surely there is a mine for silver and a place for gold to be refined. Iron is taken out of the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Miners put an end to darkness and search out the farthest bound, the ore and the gloom and deep darkness. They, 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 I, I won't go on with it, but the, the lovely imagery, and it's got images of these men swinging under deep under the earth I, i'm not sure how they did it you know evidently sort of using ropes and picks and things uh, the point being that human beings even at that stage of history seem to be able to go everywhere on the earth everywhere over the earth everywhere okay not above the earth at that stage but under the earth in other words there seems to be nothing which human beings can't uh, investigate and yet wisdom where the hell do we find it? How the hell do you make sense of what happens to us sometimes? I mean, how the hell do you make sense of things like the Holocaust? How do, the hell do you make sense, you know, at a personal level, what's happening to my friend Julian Assange? How do you how do you, how do you make sense of, of the uh, Afghanistan, of Syria, of um, so many of the terrible things we see going on and in our own lives? You know, for me, the struggle of making sense of the last couple of years of being evicted from my parish and seeing so many old friends turn on me. Um, how do I make sense of that? How do I make sense of that? I still struggle with that. Where is wisdom to be found? Where is wisdom to be found? You know, this is the, the powerful question that Job raises. And in a sense... The great thing about Job is, is simply that it's here, that the scriptures themselves give us 40-odd chapters of Job raising those questions. Now, Job will get an answer of sorts eventually. In fact, I think we'll get it next week, <laughs> if you stick with me. It's, not, it's probably not the answer any of us were looking for. I won't anticipate it, but... Uh, Suffice it to say that at this stage, to every complex problem, there's always a simple answer and it's always the wrong answer. So, you know, how do we make sense of these things? It is difficult. It is difficult. But, you know, as I say, the fact that this is here is a reminder that, that questioning God in this way is legitimate we, we need to raise our questions we shouldn't sort of pretend that it's unfaithful not to pretend that we to to try and simplify these things and suggest that they all make sense a lot of things in this life don't make sense god knows that we'll have our second reading second readings from the letter to the hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 to 16 Indeed, the word of God is living and active, 
sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul and spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just a short snippet there from this letter to the Hebrews. As I said last week, we don't know who wrote it. We don't know who exactly it's written to. I say letter to the Hebrews, it's called. The other word Hebrews never shows up in the letter. It seems to have a particularly uh, Jewish flavor to it that we assume it's written to um, uh, Jewish people, Jewish Christian people, specifically in the first century. Um, at what exact time by and by whom <laughs> we don't exactly know. As I said last week, the interesting thing with Hebrews is the in Hebrew theology, there was a great gulf between the divine and the human. You know, as, as I said last week, there's um, two sort of classic heresies, for want of a better word, that emerged in the early church. Uh, one is saying that Jesus is not God, and one is saying that Jesus was never human. Uh, the Greek way of thinking, which saw a, a continuity between the divine and the human, a sort of a chain of being going up, where we're sort of all semi-divine, somewhere on that scale. The sort of classic Greek heresy was that uh, Jesus was not fully divine. He was somewhere on that scale. Uh, the classic uh, Hebrew heresy was that uh, Jesus was not, not God, because there's a sense of a, a gulf between God and humanity. Uh, but the letter to the Hebrews really brings these two together in the most profound way. Uh, and you get that there just in these verses here. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Uh, he who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, is a very high view, we might say, of Jesus. And, you know, he's depicted in, in this letter as one who was there from the beginning of creation, there alongside God. This, uh, this, this very Jewish writer has, still has this profound sense of the uh, divine nature of Jesus. And at the same time, there's this wonderful um, emphasis on his humanity here. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. So there's a, the, we have this wonderful joint recognition of both Jesus as uh, one with God in some mysterious way and yet at the same time truly one of us one who understands us one who has been tempted as we are i don't know how we unpack that does that mean jesus experienced you know the temptations for lust and he wanted money and things like that but he had to fight those things i, I we don't know exactly we get some sort of um a sense of that in the temptation narrative is in the wilderness, don't we? That, you know, Satan tested Jesus, hey, I'll give you all this stuff, you know, power, authority, food, etc. But, uh, and Jesus battles with those temptations. But I think that, you know, the point of that, which the Hebrew make, the writer of the letter of the Hebrews makes here, is that Jesus understands us. There's nothing we struggle with that is alien to him. So that in a sense, when we pray to God, it's not as if God thinks, oh, you pathetic human, what is your problem? Uh, there's an understanding there. There's an understanding. Those struggles that we have, God understands those struggles. Jesus has been through those struggles. There is nothing alien uh, in the heart of God about what we're dealing with. And so we can be confident. Uh, coming before God as we are and finally that we'll be accepted, loved and understood. We'll stand for the gospel.
The Holy Gospel is written in the 10th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark, beginning at the 17th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honour your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Gosh, these are powerful and disturbing words, aren't they? How hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Um, I, I uh, can't hear those words without remembering Ryan Atkinson's parody, being the uh, priest at a wedding who finishes his, his sermon by saying, and remember that it's easier for a camel, for, sorry, it's easier for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a camel, uh, than it is for a camel. Which is brilliant, of course, but it's um, a reflection of the fact, I think, too, that Christian clergy, along with others, have had trouble coming to terms with this uh, extraordinary statement of Jesus: uh, easier for a rich man to eat, sorry, easier for a camel to go to the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, how do you come to terms with that? It, you may know that there's been a historical interpretation. I can't remember who was behind it that the eye of the needle was a little uh, gate into Jerusalem where, which was hard to get into, but not impossible. Basically, if you're a camel, you had to get on your knees and come in. Now, that helps mollify the uh, power of Jesus' statement, doesn't it, by suggesting that, you know, to be a rich person, you've sort of got, got to get down on your knees before you get into the kingdom. There was no such gate, okay? It's a complete myth. We can understand how the myth arose. Yes, rich people have um, always struggled with th this statement coming from Jesus. Uh, of course, the way most of us deal with it is to say, well, he's talking about rich people. He's not, he's not talking about me. You're talking about Jeff Bezos or, you know, someone really rich. Um, I think we know in our quieter moments he's talking about all of us. I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I just, personal confession, I, I don't have a lot of money now relative to most of my fellow Australians. So I sort of think, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I feel sort of strangely comforted now reading this passage. Hey, I haven't accumulated riches. Truth is, I haven't accumulated riches probably because I'm stupid in financial matters. Um, 
there's nothing, there's no great sign of virtue, I don't think, in, in my poverty. Uh, but um, the reality is, uh, particularly comparing to the standard of living in Jesus' day, I'm, I'm very rich. I, I'm not in want for food. Give us each day our daily bread. Suggests that, you know, we live by day to day. That's not me. I've got, I've got, I'm going to be fine. I've got enough in, in the bank for me and my daughter for a good deal of time uh, to come. Well, enormous amount. Enough. The point is, you know, give us our daily bread or sometimes translated, give us a day for enough for the bread of tomorrow. We, we don't need, and Jesus reminds us, doesn't he, Matthew 5, we don't need to store up our riches. You know, look at the birds of the air. They don't have great uh, things mounted up for, for years to come, do they? But they survive. God feeds them. Uh, we're supposed to be like the birds and the lilies. We don't need that sort of security, which isn't real security at all. Um, our, our real security is to our riches in heaven, Jesus says, isn't it? Where moth and rust, stay, where thieves can't steal and moth and rust don't consume. Those are the real riches. I mean, this is just really, in the end, simple good sense, isn't it? You can't take it with you. I mean, we know that. You don't have to be brilliant to work that out. And yet we still live as if our lives depended on accumulating bigger, bigger and bigger bank balances so that we can break down our barns and build bigger ones. And it's just, it's just foolish. I mean, the real uh, warning, I think, from Jesus is, is in that, um, from Matthew, where is it? Matthew 8, is it? Uh, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. Either you'll love one and hate the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money. That's the that powerful statement. I remember Kierkegaard's uh, commentary on those verses. Uh, Kierkegaard always says, we, we think... Jesus is saying, you shouldn't serve two masters. Uh, you know, bad idea, very, very spiritually corrupting. Uh, Jesus doesn't say you shouldn't serve two masters, says Kierkegaard. He says you can't. It's not possible. Not possible to devote your life to building a big, bigger bank balance and be devoted to God at the same time. And that's fleshed out here in these words to the rich young ruler, who Jesus loved, we're told. Jesus' exhortation to him comes out of love. Go, sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, and come and follow me. It's interesting. I remember a friend of mine who was, was a missionary in, um, where was it, in Africa? Sorry, it's escaped me now, but in a relatively poor country in Africa. And he said, interestingly, when they would study this passage in their Bible studies there. People would say, right, you know, we need to sell more of our possessions and um, give the money to the poor. Whereas he says when he came back to Australia in a, you know, middle-class suburb in Sydney, studying the same passage, people would say, right, we've got to change our attitude towards our possessions. <laughs> we have various ways of escaping the impact of the words of Jesus, but um, let's let's let them sink in. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. That does not to say you know it's impossible that God hates rich people. Hey, what's impossible with humanity is possible for God. That's what Jesus says. You know, God is capable of extending love and grace to all sorts of people. Even so, as, as uh, G.K. Chesterton reminded us, while it is quite possible to uh, have a lengthy debate over the question of whether Jesus believed in fairies or not, uh, it's, there's no debate to be had over whether Jesus thought there were real problems for rich people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.